All right, guys. Um, so we're starting chapter six, which is thermochemistry. Um, I'm just going to be real with y'all. Thermochemistry um, is difficult. It's more of understanding the theory behind it than um, the actual formulas. The formulas tend to be simple, but it's more of the theory behind the formulas that tends to be more um, difficult. And this a lot has to do with um, the physics behind it. This is a lot of physics in thermochemistry, and it's very abstract. So sometimes it can get pretty difficult. Okay, so um, let's dive right in. So chemical hand warmers. So we use chemical hand warmers all the time, especially when it's cold, like if you're at a um, football game or if you're out just out and about walking, we use these chemical hand warmers to warm our hands. So it's actually a um, reaction. So most hand warmers work by using the heat released from the slow oxidation of um, iron. So what happens is um, there is, it's iron plus oxygen that forms iron oxide. This is an exothermic reaction. And exothermic means that it produces heat. Okay, so it produces heat. Uh, which means that basically uh, when we use hand warmers, we use them to warm our hands. And so it's good that this produces heat. So we're looking at thermochemistry, which is a study of the relationships between chemistry and energy. So this is where kind of physics, uh, especially the theory of energy, comes into play. The amount your hand, hand temperature rises depends on several factors. So it depends on the size of the hand warmer and the size of your glove, etc. Probably um, the temperature of the air around your glove. That's another thing that can affect it. It can affect how um, thick your glove is, etc. Mainly the amount of heat released by the reaction. So um, it's good that this is a really good exothermic reaction. If we use some other reaction that wasn't as, didn't produce as much heat, say um, when you try to neutralize hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, it produces heat, yet it doesn't produce as much as this reaction does. So it's really good that this reaction does produce a lot of heat. So let's um, talk about the nature of energy. So we're gonna be talking about energy and work and heat, and a lot of these are very, um, can, are very abstract um, things. And so it says, even though chemistry is a study of matter, the energy affects matter. So energy is anything that has the capacity to do work. Well, what is work? Work is a force acting over a distance. So energy equals work equals a force acting over a distance. So an example would be a um, billiard ball. So, you know, playing pool, pool, a pool table with billiard balls. Um, we'll be using the billiard ball uh, illustration a lot, this unit, just because it's a really good illustration. It says, a billiard ball rolling across a billiard table and colliding straight on with a second stationary billiard ball. The rolling ball has energy due to its motion. When it collides with another ball, it does work. So it has energy as it's moving, and then when it collides with the other ball, it does work, resulting in the transfer of energy from one ball to the other. The second billiard ball absorbs the energy and begins to roll across the table, so there's a transfer of energy. Um, so heat is the flow of energy caused by a difference in temperature, or a difference in temperature. So heat has to do with the flow of energy, and has to do with the temperature. So, um, it says, uh, for example, if you hold a cup of coffee in your hand, energy is transferred in the form of heat from the hot coffee to your cooler hand. So there's a transfer of um, energy in the form of heat uh, to your cold hand. So energy can be exchanged between objects through contact, for example, through collision. So a collision of the billiard balls or even just holding the hot coffee, energy can be transferred between objects. So you can think of energy as the, a quantity of an object can possess or a collection of objects. You can think of heat and work as the two different ways an object can exchange energy with other objects, either in or out. So you can think of energy as a quantity, as energy as something that, uh, say, a billiard ball holds, and you can think of heat and work as an exchange of energy. So heat and work is exchanging energy. Energy is like a... Um, something that something has, a quantity that something has. So um, kinetic energy, we gotta talk about different types of energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of um, motion or energy that is being transferred. Okay, so um, 
Kinetic energy is energy due to motion or being transferred. So it says here, um, if you notice the billiard ball is moving, energy due to motion, that is kinetic energy. And um, also when it's doing work, it is uh, transferring kinetic energy. Uh, thermal energy is the energy associated with temperature. So thermal energy is a type of kinetic energy. Thermal energy is being um, transferred, therefore it's a type of kinetic energy. Um, and so thermal energy is uh, energy associated with temperature. Okay. Now potential energy is a little bit trickier. Potential energy is the energy that is stored in an object or an energy associated with the composition and position of the object. It says energy stored in the structure of a compound is potential energy. So um, the potential energy of the billiard ball, for example, is a result of its position in the Earth's gravitational field. Raising the ball off the table against the Earth's gravitational pull gives the ball more potential energy. So this ball is being raised above the table, therefore the potential energy is increasing. It has the potential to fall further. Um, another example of potential energy is the energy contained in a compressed spring. So say you all know what a spring is. It's um, Think of like spring mattresses. When you push, when you compress the spring, you push against the forces that tend to maintain the spring's uncompressed shape, storing energy as potential energy. So say you have a spring like this, and when you push it down, you're, um, you're forcing the energy, or you're forcing the, uh, or you're pushing against the forces that maintain the spring's uncompressed shape. Therefore, you're storing energy. And so that uh, spring has a potential energy to go spring right back up, yet it's not doing it yet. So potential energy I like to think of as um, energy that can happen but it has not happened yet. Okay, so chemical energy. Chemical energy is potential energy due to the structure of the atoms, position relative to each other, or in the molecule or the molecule's relative positions in the structure. So in some chemical compounds, such as methane and natural gas, or the iron in a chemical hand warmer, are like compressed springs. They contain potential energy, and a chemical reaction can release that potential energy. So in, um, in reactions, there are potential energies with the reactants. And when that reaction occurs, it releases that potential energy. And it releases that potential energy into a uh, form it, usually changes into kinetic energy. Um, so it's the, just basically the potential for a compound or an element to react. How much is it going to react? Obviously, if it's more reactive, it's going to have a higher potential energy and a higher chemical energy. So here's just a um, kind of a flow chart that kind of uh, summarizes energy. So energy is the capacity to do work. Um, and remember, work is the amount of force required to um, push something a certain length. And so kinetic energy is due to motion. Thermal energy is associated with temperature. Think about temperature. Temperature is how fast the molecules are moving. Well, it makes sense that thermal energy is kinetic energy because it's due to motion. The molecules are moving. Temperature. Potential energy is due to its position or composition, and a type of potential energy is chemical energy associated with the positions of electrons and the nuclei. So it's reactivity, really. All right, so let's um, talk about conservation of energy. So the law of conservation of energy states that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. When energy is transferred between objects or converted from one form to another, the total amount of energy present at the beginning must be present at the end. So for example, if you drop a raised ball some of its potential energy becomes kinetic energy as the ball falls towards the table. Same as, um, here's this example with the spring. So she is pushing down the spring, and that is uh, mechanical potential energy. There are different types. We talk about chemical and chemistry, obviously. She's pu pushing down the spring, so it has the potential to spring back up. But it, the actual act of it springing back up is the kinetic energy. It's moving. This has the potential to move. This is what actually is moving, is the um, spring coming back up. And so that is the kinetic energy actually acting upon it. 
So systems and surroundings. So it's very important that you understand the difference between a system and a surrounding. Because what we're gonna talk about in a second is we're comparing system and surroundings and how heat is transferred. So we define the system as the material or process within which we are studying the energy changes within. So um, an example of a system is the system may be the chemicals in a beaker or it may be the iron reacting in the hand warmer. So the actual things that are reacting is the system. The iron and the oxygen are reacting to form iron oxide and they release heat, that is the system. Now we define the surroundings as everything else in which the system can exchange energy. So surroundings is the things that are happening around them. So if we define the chemicals in the beaker as a system, the surroundings may include the water in which the chemicals are dissolved for aqueous solutions, the beaker itself, the lab bench on which it, the beaker sits, the air in the room, and so on. For the iron in the hand warmer, the surroundings include your hands, your glove, the air in the glove, even the air outside the glove, etc. How thick is your jacket? Is your hand in your jacket or is it outside of your jacket? So all of that, the surroundings is what affects the system. The surroundings affects the system. Um, it says we, what, we can, what we study is the exchange of energy between the system and the surroundings. Now comparing the amount of energy in the system and surroundings uh, during transfer. Conservation of energy means that the amount of energy gained or lost by the system has to be equal to the amount of energy lost or gained by the surroundings. Okay, so if one, think of it as like a, um, like a gauge, like a gas gauge. Okay, so um, system energy gauge is a lot like the gas gauge. So here is the system energy gauge. Okay, that's basically the chemicals reacting. It's pretty full. And here's the surroundings gauge. Well, if that energy is transferred to the surroundings, then obviously the system um, gauge went down and the surrounding gauge went up. The surroundings gained the um, same exact amount of energy lost by the system. Think of the law of thermodynamics, or the first law of thermodynamics. There's, it, uh, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Therefore, the surroundings gain the exact amount of energy lost by the system. They're going to gain the exact amount of energy lost by the system. In an energy exchange, energy transforms between the system and the surroundings. If the system loses energy, the surroundings gain the same amount of energy and vice versa. When the iron within the chemical hand warmer reacts, the system loses energy to the surroundings, producing the desired temperature to increase within your gloves. And so what happens is um, the system loses energy, therefore it's releasing energy to the surroundings, and that's the heat. It's releasing thermal energy to the surroundings, um, and therefore that's what makes your uh, hand warmer warm. Okay, let's talk about units of energy. So we kind of touched on this a little bit um, last unit. Um, but the amount of kinetic energy an object has is directly proportional to its mass and velocity. So last unit we talked about kinetic energy is 3 halves um, RT, 3 halves um, R and then Kelvin. When the mass is in kilograms and velocity is in meters per second, so our mass is in kilograms, oops, our mass is in kilograms and our velocity is in meters per second. The unit for the kinetic energy is kilograms per meter squared, because look, velocity is squared, um, divided by second squared. One joule of energy, so we kind of touched on the joule, so remember that R that we used for um, the uh, measuring of the velocity of the particles within the gas um, had joule in it. It says one joule of energy is the amount of energy needed to move a one kilogram mass at a speed of one meters per second. Okay, so one joule of energy is the amount of energy needed to move a one kilogram mass at the speed of one meters per second. It's the amount of energy used, say you had a one kilogram mass and you moved it one meter per second. That is the amount of energy you used to move that one kilogram thing one meter. Okay, so one joule equals one kilogram per times meter squared divided by second squared. 